Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as your moderator this evening as we adventure through Europe's offbeat wonders with Rick. Now, without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to our tour guide for this evening, Rick Steves. Rick, over to you. Hey, thanks very much, Gabe. And we're going offbeat wonders today. And uh, I think we'd start off that with a, a little bit of this. There's an offbeat wonder for you. How's your Cyrillic? Zhivulevskoy. Zhivulevskoy. Maybe that's close, but underneath, can you see that little word right there? Now, I was just noticing that tonight, this is Russian beer, and that's Cyrillic. And it's uh, in, Czech, in the Czech Republic, Pivo is beer, Pivo, P-I-V-O. And they don't have the Cyrillic alphabet, they got a Slavic language. Well, this is Pivo, the Slavic word for beer, ha, in Russian. And um, that's gonna be part of my cultural experience today is drinking a Russian beer because we're going way off the beaten path. And one thing we wanna do also is make sure you're comfortable. I hope you're with your favorite travel partners. I hope you've got something to munch on and maybe something to drink and maybe an exotic beer. I'm gonna be eating Georgian today. And Georgia is famous. We're not talking Atlanta here. We're talking the, the former uh, uh, Republic in the, in the Soviet Union 50 years ago, Georgia. And uh, their food is really great. So we're gonna be eating Georgian. I'm gonna introduce you that in just a minute. Um, but uh, right now, I just wanna thank you for joining us. You know, I get to travel in Europe 100 days out of every year. And when I'm home, I'm usually flying around the country giving lectures. I haven't done either of that this year, but I'm just so thankful that I've got Mondays where I can enthuse about travel to all my travel and friends. And that means you. So come on in, make yourself at home. I love screwing around on Monday. I'm just, I feel like I've got guests coming over for dinner and I've got my, well, let me just show you what I've got here. We're going Georgian and a big part of Georgian is, uh, their, their, their boats. This, this, is, this is called a kachapuri, and it's a boat uh, made out of bread. And that came over with the, uh, with the Romans uh, in ancient times, they say. And they didn't have tomatoes more than 500 years ago in Europe. So they just filled it with meat and cheese and so on and put a couple of eggs on it and some peppers. And that's your Georgian pizza. So I'm going to be munching on my kachapuri. Also, when you go Georgian, I was going to say, I was in St. Petersburg in Russia a little while ago. And my friends in Russia, when they want to go ethnic, like Americans would go to Chinese or Japanese or Mexican food. In Russia, the number one eating out ethnic would be Georgian. And what they just love are the keen kale. These are dumplings, Georgian dumplings. They're um, sort of like hand pies. And, you know, like in, in, a, in a Cornwall in England, they have the pasties that the miners would take with them for, uh, for their lunch. Well, this is, uh, this is a pasty and it's a dumpling and it's got meat inside and it's just, it's full of just delicious um, broth and it's a kind of a mess to eat it but it's a lot of fun and it's really tasty that's a georgian standard and we've also got eggplant walnut rolls this is you know sliced uh, strips of eggplant baked in olive oil and then filled with uh, sort of a walnut paste and sprinkled it with beautiful beautiful pomegranate seeds i love them um we're gonna have your typical from this region salad with walnut dressing mm. and after dinner I'm going to go with the honey because honey is a big deal throughout the Slavic world. You go to the markets in, in the Slavic world and honey is like it's medicinal. They got honey for, for um, any kind of ailment. They got honey to, to keep you young. They got honey to get you well. They got honey for aphrodisiacs. They got all sorts of maids with little toothpicks wanting you to try their honey. And this is just honey cake with honey cookies, seven layers drizzled with honey. And I, I tossed a few... Um, blueberries on there just for fun. But I'm going to have that later on. And I'm going to be sipping my Russian beer. I'm having Russian beer in Georgia, because back in the Soviet days, there was just one beer, basically, for the entire Soviet Union. And it was this stuff, the Zhigulevskoy. And it was almost the generic word for beer. Hmm. Yeah, it tastes about like what you would expect. Hmm. 
I'll drink it. Now, um, I want to remind you, we're going to go now to Offbeat Wonders, and I want to take you to our behind-the-scenes way we put this together. And uh, I'm just going to take you to our website, ricksteves.com. And when you go to ricksteves.com, it is a wonderland of information. We just love to share information generously. It's kind of like our publicity stunt. And when you go to ricksteves.com, um, you've got all the easy tabs here. you got our latest TV shows. Click here, and, and you, can, uh, you can just check out whatever whatever TV shows are, are happening. Uh, you've even got the bingo corner. I didn't uh, have a chance to uh, sort of enthuse about that, but we got bingo pages where you can have some fun with your friends. It's kind of a, it's either bingo or a drinking game, but that's a lot of fun. Um, I wanna remind you when you go to our website, you can also find out about our tours. We're not selling tours right now, but we're taking people's names on the wish list and we've got thousands of people with their names on the list because we got our hotels, our guides, and our buses ready and raring to go as soon as the coast is clear. And when that happens remains to be seen. How long will it take for America to get its vaccinations? That's kind of it. Boy, oh boy, get on that vaccination boat because we can't leave until everybody's on board. And one thing I like about our tour program right now is while we're not able to sell tours, we've got the guides marketplace. And this is where we connect our guides who are unable to work with our travelers or are unable to travel. And there's 60 or 70 guides contributing here. It's all so much fun. They're passionate about sharing their culture and most of it is free. And uh, we curate it, our market picks of the week. Let me just show you our market picks of the week here because these are our favorites just for this week. In Portugal, we've got a talk by Rafael, who's one of our favorite Portuguese guides about Portuguese gastronomy and culture. Uh, our wonderful Greek guide from Olympia is gonna give us a walk through the place of the first Olympic games, Nikki. Uh, our guide in Northern Italy, Lisa Anderson, is gonna teach us how to cook stinging nettle tagliatelle. Our guide in Sevilla, is going to, Robert is going to take us to the, the Moorish baths and Francisco, who's our guide in Pamplona where they have the running of the bulls. He's going to explain the mystery of bullfighting. So lots to see and do there if you would like. And uh, this is just an example of the fun we've got going when you want to join us. But I want to go right now to our, um, what I want to do is I want to go to, if I can get there elegantly, our Classroom Europe. Here's the tab in the lower left on our main page. And you know, with every Monday night travel, we like to go and celebrate this gift we made for teachers and homeschooling parents. It cuts all of our 150 TV shows down to 500 clips. And then, but what I wanna do today is just remind you that we can put together these playlists any way we want. And what we've done to save you all the trouble, we've gathered six videos, 29 minutes right here. And that's the playlist we're gonna to see today, Offbeat Wonders. I do wanna remind you, in the public playlist section, this is where everybody can share their playlists. And I know Gabe actually goes in and makes Monday Night Travel playlists. And this is where we store the, the shows that we've done in past weeks, if you wanted to see those on your own without all of the interruptions from me. But we are going to go to um, Offbeat Europe, and we're gonna go there right now. And we're going to go to that playlist that I just mentioned. And when we go to this, I want to remind you, we're going to be starting in like the ultimate offbeat destination in the Czech Republic. This is the eastern state of the Czech Republic. It's called Moravia. And there's a town in Moravia, the historic capital, and it is Olomouc. Have you ever heard of Olomouc? It's just two hours from Prague. Everybody goes to Prague. It's a medieval Disneyland. You can just get on a train, go to Olomouc, and this is a second city, a classic second city. Everybody goes to Paris, check out Lyon. Everybody goes to Edinburgh, check out Glasgow. Everybody goes to Berlin, check out Hamburg. Everybody goes to Prague, check out Olomouc. Let's go there right now. Thanks for joining us on Monday Night Travels. Let's see, here we go. As Europe unites into one vast free trade zone, it's employing its own kind of internal Marshall Plan, investing hundreds of billions of dollars into its own infrastructure. Here in the Czech Republic, they've got a new express train zipping you in less than two hours from Prague to here, Olomouc. When I look at that, it's amazing to me. That was a miraculous kind of good luck on camera. I'm doing the on-camera, walking down the, the track, the train zipping by, and just when I'm finished, the train's gone, and it reveals the sign behind me that says Olomitz. I wish I could say we planned that, but it was just dumb luck. At circa 1950s train station is a fascinating blend of old and new. 
bright and happy workers put down their hammers and sickles long enough to greet you, a reminder of the country's recent communist past. Just a short tram ride from the station gets us to the old town center. Olomouc, the historic capital of this region, is the Czech Republic's fifth largest city with 100,000 people and home to a leading university. With its wealth of cafes, clubs, and student life, Olomouc gives you vibrant local culture without the tourist crowds and high prices of Prague. I'm joined by my Czech friend and co-author of my Czech Republic guidebook, Hansa Vihan. So, Moravia, is that a political unit or an ethnic region? Moravia is a region in the eastern part of the Czech Republic. And how would you describe the Moravian <clears throat> people? Well, to generalize, the Moravians are more emotional and friendlier than the people in the western part of the country. The fortune and misfortune of Olomouc comes from its strategic location at the intersection of Central Europe's main east-west and north-south trade routes. The city's historic core is simply workaday Moravia. Trams clatter through the streets, as they have for a century. The town's economy is lively, even without much tourism. Standing in front of the town hall, surrounded by the vast square and its fine, noble, and bourgeois residences, you can imagine the importance of Olomouc in centuries past. The people here are proud, as if their fine city was still ruling Moravia, which it hasn't done since about 1640. Locals brag that their city is home to the country's second most important bishop and its second most important university. Perennially number two Olomouc actually built its bell tower to be six feet taller than Prague's. But when it comes to plague monuments, Olomouc is unrivaled. This baby is the tallest and most grandiose anywhere. Throughout Central Europe, squares like this are decorated with similar structures, erected by locals to give thanks for surviving the plague. The tip of the column features the Holy Trinity, God the Father making a blessing, Christ sitting on a globe, and the dove representing the Holy Spirit. Tumbling below the Trinity, the Archangel Michael, with his ever-ready sword and shield, reminds us that the church is in a constant struggle with evil. It all sits upon a tiny chapel, where on the day the column was inaugurated in 1754, the mighty Habsburg Empress, Maria Theresa, who traveled all the way from Vienna, knelt to pray. Devout, yet envious, proud little Olomutz, way out here in Moravia, had a plague column grander than Vienna's. A series of allegorical fountains decorate the old town. Most were inspired by classical mythology. This one, featuring Julius Caesar, is dedicated to the legendary founder of the town. The modern turtle fountain is a popular meeting place for young mothers and a fine place to watch toddlers enjoy the art. This astronomical clock was destroyed by the Nazis in World War II. Today's version was rebuilt in 1953 by the communists with their kitschy flair for propaganda. In Boy, I want to remind you, one of the most powerful kinds of art in the 20th century was this socialist realism of the Soviet Union. You know, artists and creative people, composers and sculptors and so on, they were censored so hard in the Soviet Union that it wasn't, you couldn't say something bad about the system. It was, if you're going to say anything at all, it's got to be something good about the system. <laughs> and that's what they had to do. And you see that it just, the socialist realism permeated uh, the whole communist world. And uh, you see it right here when you go to this, what would be normally just a medieval fancy clock. Now it's got all of this uh, Soviet kind of propaganda woven into it. Good social realist style, you have earnest chemists and heroic mothers rather than holy saints and Virgin Marys. In this region so rich in agriculture, these symbols of the 12 months each feature a seasonal farm activity. High noon is marked by a proletarian parade when a mechanical conga line of milkmaids, clerks, blacksmiths, teachers, and first defenders are celebrated as the champions of everyday society. As with any full-service astronomical clock, there's a wheel with 365 saints, so you'll always know whose special day it is. And this clock comes with a Moscow-inspired bonus. Red bands splice in the special days of communist heroes. 
Lenin died on the 21st day of the year. Stalin's saint was Thomas, day 355. We can't leave Olomouc without experiencing one of the city's greatest attractions. It's notoriously stinky cheese. So we all know about the great Czech beer, but what's with this famous cheese from Moravia? Well, the Olomoucké Tvarushky yeah. <laughs> well, is the stinkiest cheese in the whole country. And, uh, <laughs> really? If there is one thing you associate with Olomouc, is this cheese. <laughs> My mom, who comes from this region, when I was a kid, when she would start eating this at home, <laughs> Me and my dad, we just clear out the kitchen. So the, the thing that makes this cheese is the way it ages. It ages on a aged meat. So the meat itself has to be aged to age this cheese. And then you have to age in order to learn to like this cheese. Now what are you putting on it? That's young onion, young strong onion. And why is that important? It's good for you as a man. <laughs> it stings, but it's good. And what is this? These? These are really strong mints. <laughs> so you can go and kiss your wife when you go home. <laughs> ah, Hans is so great. I'm so lucky and I'm just such a I'm so fortunate to have guys like Hans. What a what a what a brilliant guide he is. And it's it's I'm I'm proud to bring our groups to Czech Republic and put them in the care of a of a guide like Hansa. You know, um Hans is one of our our great uh uh, co-authors. He co-authors our book on the Czech Republic and Prague. Okay, we've just had the stinky cheese. I don't even think you can get that in the United States. It's that stinky. Now we're going to go to Montenegro. I want to remind you, everybody goes to Dubrovnik. It's a touristy place. It's wonderful. I love it. But there's a, an amazing day trip from there. If you just go an hour and a half south, it's Montenegro. And all the tourists who do go to Montenegro and the cruise groups, there's little cruise ships that can fit into the bay and so on. They stay right there on, at sea level, but you can go up into the mountains. It's called Montenegro, the, the Black Mountain up on the very top. And uh, what we're going to see now is two clips on Montenegro. The first one is the sea level Montenegro. And then the second one is a clip that never made it into our show. We haven't shown it anywhere else. And it is this magical kingdom up on top. We're going to get a double dose of Montenegro right now. <laughs> Montenegro, where towering mountains meet the Adriatic, is both scenic and humble. One of Europe's newest and smallest countries, it's about the size of Connecticut, with well under a million people. It's a country of contrasts, an intriguing combination of rugged landscapes, communist-era decrepitude, and an emerging Mediterranean hotspot that's quite popular with the cruising crowd. Montenegro's Bay of Kotor is an easy day trip from Dubrovnik. Its fjord-like cliffs rise out of the Adriatic, surrounding ancient towns packed with history, all tied together by a twisty road. The narrow mouth of the bay, easy to defend yet deep enough for big ships, defines an ideal and strategic natural harbor. At the Venetian-flavored seafront town of Perost, locals ferry visitors out to a man-made island that comes with a fascinating story. 500 years ago, local fishermen found an icon of the Virgin Mary stranded on a reef right here. They spent the next two centuries sinking old boats and dropping rocks every time they sailed by, eventually building the island and the church, Our Lady of the Rocks. The church, with its legendary icon above its high altar, is festooned with symbols of thanks for answered prayers. Countless votive plaques, bouquets and ribbons from happy brides married here, and paintings of ships engulfed in storms. These were commissioned by sailors who survived, thankful for Mary's protection. Tucked among a clutter of nautical artifacts is a delicate treasure. This This is a good example of the little wonders that you can walk right by if you don't have good information or a guide. And uh, you know, you can do that. You don't need to take a tour to have this. You can have the information, but you gotta be thoughtful about these sites. And then when you find a little special moment, you gotta let it breathe. Here's a little nondescript embroidery 
that became one of the highlights of my trip because I got the chance to imagine who made it and why. Broidery was a labor of love created by a local woman. For 25 years, she toiled using the finest materials available, silk and her own hair. The cherubs show the years passing as the hair of the angels, like the hair of the artist herself, went from dark to white. Humble and anonymous, she had faith that her work was worthwhile and would be appreciated, as it is two centuries later by a steady parade of travelers from distant lands. The bay's main town, also called Kotor, has been protected from centuries of would-be invaders by its imposing wall. Its fortifications begin as stout ramparts along the waterfront, then climb up and up to control the strategic high ground. Kotor's harbor is now a hit with recreational yachters. Its gate welcomes visitors into the old town and a main square busy with cafes. It's worn of tangled alleys and hidden squares seem custom made for exploring. From Kotor, a small road zigzags 25 times high above the sea, up through the clouds, and into the historic heartland of this country. The old road, little more than an overgrown donkey path, was once the mountain kingdom's umbilical cord to the Adriatic. Look at that little road. That was the kingdom's umbilical cord. I mean, people marvel at the little switchback road I'm on in our car. And then you look out to the left and you see what was the main drag into the country. And that, when I look at that, I think natural fortifications in a time when all sorts of craziness was going on. And, and there was no firm borders. There was bully groups and there were bullied groups, the, the meek and the mild. And the bullies would come and the meek and the mild would hide out. And there was a little kingdom high up in the mountains there in what we think of as you know, former Yugoslavia. And there up in the mountains, they created a kingdom called the well, Montenegro. That's the Italian word for Cernagora, which is the local word for Black Mountain. When you get up there, there's a two-bit little palace from the two-bit little prince from 150 years ago. And there was one piano in the whole country. And they carried it up this path. And I'm, it's so romantic and it's so evocative to me. They carried the prince's piano up this path. They got it up there. And then there was nobody to tune it. My dad was a piano tuner, so I'm tuned into this kind of stuff. But it just sat there going out of tune. But it was the only piano in Montenegro. And when you go where we're going to go now in a minute, ah, you'll see what I'm talking about. Cresting the ridge, we enter another world, an inhospitable land of rocks, scrub brush, and ramshackle farmhouses. The black mountains that define this basin gave this country its name, Montenegro. Okay, so that was in the regular TV show. This is something that we made, and I just loved it, but it just couldn't fit into a 30-minute program. On We were doing something on uh, Croatia with a side trip to Montenegro. So as you look at this, think about the places that are hiding out today, just like they hid out in the Middle Ages, hiding out from modern tourism. Uh, so this is a bit that hit the cutting room floor, and I want to remind you, it's just two hours south of Dubrovnik, and you could go there yourself. You could hire Stefan, who we're going to meet here. He's just a local hardworking kid who's a guide. He's a licensed guide. He speaks great English. He'd love some work. I know it would be, boy, what a deal to have a friend in Montenegro. The Black Mountains that define this basin gave this country its name, Montenegro. The road leads to Sintinia, the old royal capital, back when this kingdom was a mountain stronghold. Today, Sintinia is a workaday two-story town. There's barely a hint of its former status other than the Montenegrin president's official residence. Former embassies sit vacant. While the economy feels flat, life goes on. To better understand this scene, I'm joined by local guide Stefan Dukanovic, who points out that while the king's long gone, the town remains the religious capital of his country. Its Orthodox monastery, the still-beating spiritual heart of Montenegro, is dedicated to St. Peter of Sintinia, a 12th-century local priest who inspired his people to defend Christianity against the Muslims. This is a glorious screen. Yeah, it is. Actually, it's the iconostasis, you know, place where just priests can go in time of service, and that's typical for um, Orthodox churches. And uh, most of people from Montenegro are actually Serbian Orthodox Christians. 
here in this church we can see also some very very important relics not just from Montenegrins but we can see from the Christians from whole part of the world because uh, here in front of us we can see uh, the right hand of Saint John the Baptist. So that important relic kind of substantiates the fact that this is the most important religious place in Montenegro. Exactly. This exactly. church. Tucked between the rugged peaks, communities and fertile valleys offer more insights into this persistent culture. Humble Montenegrin towns like Negosi seem quiet, but there's industry where you might not expect it. There's a lot of ham. Yeah, a lot of ham and a lot of smoke. As you can see, actually what makes hams from Montenegro different than the hams from the, we can say, other part of the Mediterranean coast is actually process of smoking because 15 days, 24 hours per day, they're putting the smoke right here. They use just beech wood for, 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 for the smoke uh, from local national park, and that gives, we can say, the special taste to the hams from this village, Njegoshi. So after 15 days of smoking, uh, next 11 months, they are drying the meat just on the air, and every 10 or 15 days, you know, people who are doing that, that process are testing, actually, if the meat is good. They take like a wooden sticks which they put inside of the meat, pull it out and then uh, they smell if the meat is good and by the smell they can feel if the process is okay. Yeah, that ham was okay. Now, we're gonna take a little break before we go to Romania. And we're gonna play some Where's Rick? This is our little tease game. We take five teases from five TV shows and you know, we've done this 150 times with every show. We have the beginning, it's called the tease. And we just pop up and we go, hey, I'm Rick Steves back with more of the best of Europe. This time we're doing this, 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 and this because we are in, and then we reveal it. And then we're gonna hit pause, wait for five seconds. You get to guess it. If you get it wrong, you gotta take a drink. If you get it right, take a drink too. And then we'll do another, we'll do five of these. Here we go. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time we're deep in the south of Spain, in Andalusia. This. Andalusia, it's a fun way to pronounce Andalusia. It's Sevilla. Hold on to your castanet. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time we're traveling in northern Europe, where the mountains meet the sea. It's the best. Looks a lot like Seattle. In fact, it's the sister city of Seattle of Western Norway. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time we're in for a stunning array of cultural treats, and it's more than just great food. This is- Oh, I love tapas, and in this little corner of Spain, it's called pinchos. The land of the Basque people. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we got plenty of horsepower I for have. an amazing trip <laughs> in... Romania. 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 Thanks for joining us. Oh, God. I just love that. It is so cool to be able to be there and to be connecting with those cultures and to be eating the cuisine every week. We have some, I'm just enjoying the food dimension of our Monday night travel parties. Let me review with you again what I've got going on here because I'm enjoying this. I've just had a slice of my uh, boat, the local pizza. This is called kachapuri. And uh, you, you, you just put a couple of uh, egg yolks on there, heat it up and you got yourself a pizza without tomato. Also, um, I wanted to be sure that you pay attention to these keen kali. And this is the local dumpling. And when you bite into it, I did this with my friends in Russia because that's where they go and they go out to eat. Hmm. That is, I can see why the Russians are all crazy about Georgian because when they think Georgian, they think King Kali. Hmm. I'll have more of that, but I won't do that while I'm talking. And um, we're also drinking our pivo. That's your word for the day in Slavic, whether you're in Czech Republic or Georgia or Russia, Pivo, right there you see it in clear Cyrillic, P-I-V-O. And um, right now we're gonna go to Romania. We're gonna go to Romania and um, it's a country where people actually wear hats like this. And this is a good example of one of those souvenirs you buy because you think it looks cool on you when you're there and you get home and you kind of go, no, I don't think I'll go into the market today with my Romanian hat, but it's a cute souvenir. We're gonna see a man who wears it very well 
in just a moment. So let's go back right now to our show, and we're going to take you to Romania. Thank you so much for traveling with us today on Monday Night Travel. Oh. <laughs> Pondering the challenges of maintaining traditions in an aggressively modern world, we leave Transylvania and drive north. At the fringe of the country, tucked next to the Ukrainian border, is Romania's most isolated region, Mara Morish. Mara Morish is fiercely traditional. Its centuries-old ways endure. Horse carts are commonplace. The men wear distinctive straw hats. The women are tough as the land. People work the fields as they have for generations. Village roads are lined with ornate wooden gateways. These gateways are intentionally elaborate, designed to show off the family's wealth. The gates protect family compounds. Along with the home, you'll find a barn, a garden, and an old-time dipping well. And if you've never tried one of these, locals are happy to demonstrate. Can you show me the well? No. Yeah? What do we have? Yeah? yeah? Like this. Okay. Nice. Okay, so into the horses. That is real. I mean, it looks like we're in some kind of an open air folk museum, but no, this is just flat out real and anybody can experience it. You need to be a bit of an extrovert. You got to put yourself in a community like this. You got to walk down the street and invite yourself into somebody's yard. An older woman is pulling some water out of her well. Help her out. Help her out. Get wet in the local culture. You can do it. Here's another example. Stay in a bed and breakfast. I mean, this is just an ad lib, spontaneous, wonderful moment. A little bit of positive serendipity. Thank goodness our camera was there. We stayed in the B&B. &B. You could stay in this B&B &B too. They'd love to have you. There we go. We're staying at a farmhouse B&B. &B. Our host ritualistically closes the gate behind us. People here are superstitious, especially after dark. It's dinner time, but first, we're getting a little tour. Traditional Romanians collect their nicest belongings into one room designed to impress their guests. Heirloom dowries are lovingly displayed. These are bridal gifts going back generations. Tonight, we're being treated to a farmer's feast. The food is typical of the region, rustic, delicious, and farm fresh. Our host, Anna, is determined to feed us well. Hearty salads, cabbage rolls, polenta is a daily treat around here, and pork is big. In Romania, like everywhere else, food is especially tasty when it's local and fresh. And everything goes better with the local firewater. So there's Cameron. He's the, the man just uh, on, to the left of me. And Cameron is uh, sort of the, the master on, in our company, company of Eastern Europe. He is, is as passionate about Eastern Europe as I am about Western Europe. And without Cameron, frankly, we wouldn't have an Eastern Europe program. He has driven it. And he's so prolific. He's uh, co-authored uh, or spearheaded most of the books that we do on Eastern Europe. And Cameron went ahead and scouted both our Bulgaria and our and our Romania TV shows. And where he doesn't have a big on, on camera presence in the show, he is the guy who is the fixer. He's got the contacts. He wrote the scripts. And uh, it's a complicated thing to write a script about a country like Romania or Bulgaria. It's not very complicated to write a script about Germany or France or Spain. But in these countries, all the descriptions are just like loaded with political dangers if you say the wrong thing the wrong way. And Cameron finessed it beautifully. By the way, Cameron took a sabbatical for a few months during this pandemic lockdown, and he did something he's wanted to do for a long time. He wrote his book, which is his collection of his favorite experiences traveling. And it'll be out in a few months. And stay tuned to us because we'd love to turn you on to Cameron's book when it is available. But thanks to Cameron for the shows that we do, especially in Eastern Europe. And Cameron helped, uh, well, he wrote the scripts to Poland. We had everything set up and we had to cancel that last summer. And as soon as this pandemic cloud lifts, Cameron's going to be on our crew as we go to Poland. And then we're going to do two shows with Cameron on Iceland also. Uh -huh.
After dinner, the evening continues in the music room, where Anna's husband gets out his violin and shares some rousing folk music. So that yelp was a yelp of pure joy. And they were happy to have us there. This wasn't planned, but after dinner, they said, come on in. We'd like to sing and, and uh, play the fiddle and, and uh, give you a little folk music. And then the next morning, we visited this woman in her house. And again, this culture is so alive in this northern region of Romania, Mara Marush. In this traditional community, many homes are busy with small-scale crafts and industry. Just up the lane, we meet a family who welcomes us into their cozy yet busy world. The daughter, using a technique that goes back to ancient times, gracefully spins raw wool into yarn. Inside, her mother weaves the yarn into bolts of cloth, which will eventually be made into heavy woolens for the winter. Next door, a water mill does the same work it's done since medieval times. With the flip of a giant lever, George, the miller, sets things in motion. All of this powers his fulling mill, which takes the neighbor's woven wool to the next stage. Wooden hammers relentlessly pummel the fabric. With the help of hot water, the wool... So George is wearing my hat there, you can see. He wears it quite nicely. <laughs> and uh, George loves his brandy, I'll tell you that. And everywhere he went with us, he had a little jug of brandy hiding in a corner that he could take a nip on whenever he had a little thirst. Uh, if he was, uh, if this was an English speaking country, his last name would probably be Miller. Think about it in the Middle Ages. He would be known as George the Miller, George Miller. I don't know how to say it in Romanian, but that was his role in that society. He ran the mill. All is pounded into a dense felt. The finished product is heavy and warm ideal for the frigid Romanian winter. The water wheel also powers grinding stones. To this day, villagers drop off their grain to be ground into everything from animal feed to polenta. And George also has his own still for making the local brandy, horinka. He stokes the fire and patiently stirs his heated plum mash to keep it from burning. After its steamy journey through his low-tech water cooler, George's beloved fire water trickles into his bucket. And you can't visit George's distillery without tasting the final product. Oh, yeah. Good. Mara Moorish has some of the finest wooden churches in Europe. Their graceful spires punctuate the countryside. Soaring skyward, they seem to connect earth with heaven. The exteriors show off the quality craftsmanship of local woodworkers through the centuries. And our guide, Teo, shows us how beautifully decorated the interiors are. Teo, this is remarkable. And how old is this church? 17th century. And how old are all these beautiful paintings? 18th century. You know, they look more simple, like what you would see 14th century in France or Germany. Yeah, it was a kind of a delay or a very long-lasting tradition. And the carpets. I've never seen a church with carpets everywhere. They are gifts from donators, from parishioners, from the ladies. So ladies want to show their devotion. They bring a carpet. Yes, it's a kind of devotion, a kind of sacrifice, let's say it. And these beautiful embroideries, are these gifts also from parishioners? Yes, for example, here you can see it bears even the donator name. Oh, that's Yorka the name Palaguza. of the woman who, the who embroidered woman. this. Even modern churches are still built in the traditional wooden style. Dating from 1995, this one towers 250 feet, with artistic shingle work cascading from peak to eaves. Again, the technical mastery of the woodworkers is on display. Chunky timbers, precisely dovetailed, keep massive walls firmly in place. Look at that. Look at that piece of art right there. Just looking up at the beautiful small town architecture made out of wood. This is, this is an example of the wonders that are hiding out that most of people just, they go to Salzburg and they go to Amsterdam, they complain about the crowds. Yeah, Amsterdam's great. I love Venice. I love Barcelona. But you've got alternatives. That's maybe a theme of today's Monday Night Travel. You've got alternatives. And 
when you go to places like this, you're better able to connect with the people because they're not overrun by tourists. Romania is wide open. It's interesting. It was one of the darkest corners of the Warsaw Pact back during the difficult and dark times of communism. But today it's warm, it's joyful, it's welcoming. It's sort of a exuberance, a, a lightness, a, a, I don't know, uh, an embrace of life that's illustrated, I think, very well in this next cemetery. It's a joyful cemetery, if you can imagine that. Just up the road is another unforgettable church, this one with an unusually joyful cemetery. In 1935, a local woodcarver, reviving an old tradition, began adorning what's known as the Mary Cemetery with a forest of vivid memorials. Each one comes with a whimsical poem and a painting of the departed in the moment of death, or doing something they loved. Even if you can't read the poems, the images speak volumes. From a lifetime commitment to a traditional trade, like weaving, baking, or woodworking. A more modern one, like television repair, or to a passion for bicycles. A sad early end by a lightning strike, or a humorous memorial to a lifetime spent enduring a nagging mother-in-law. It's a poignant and good-natured celebration of each individual's life, as well as a chronicle of village history. And it's all painted in cheery blue to match the heavens where these souls are headed. Okay, I had to give you a little blooper here with George. I was working very hard with George. He wasn't the greatest on-camera partner for me, and I needed to get another drink poured into my glass of the local brandy. George. You want me, you know what I'm gonna do? There's a little bird over there. Boom, okay. Kind of a little, Horinka, George. <laughs> Horinka, I'm empty. Oh, come on, give me some for George. Here, here, pour me some, yeah, Horinka. Wow. <laughs> okay, I wanna remind you, when you travel, you come home just thinking, it was the people, it was the people that made this a beautiful experience. Wherever you're traveling on this planet, domestically or internationally or whatever, it's the people. One of my favorite things to do when we're making a TV show is to do what we call a face montage. And I, 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 in certain countries, especially a place like Romania, I would ask my producer, Simon, Simon, can we do a face montage? It's kind of like, Simon, can we do a face montage, please, please, please? And Simon goes, well, it takes a long time to do a face montage correct. We're going to have to give the cameraman enough time, in other words, to get away from some of the other things I'm determined to do in our limited time in the field. And uh, we, we, we dedicate the time and we get those faces because our artful editor, Steve Camerano, weaves it all together in a face montage like this. And I would just love it right now if you would look into each of these people's eyes. And remember, these are Romanians. They could be Pakistanis, they could be Burmese, they could be, uh, you know, from, uh, from New Zealand, they could be Namibian, they could be Colombian, I don't know, they're just everywhere. When you look into the eyes of the people, you get to know these people, you realize this, this world is just filled with joy, and it's filled with love. And if we could all just, I'm getting sappy here, but when you look into these eyes, you'll know what I mean. We're looking into people that remind us that this world we're all brothers and sisters. Check this out. Cultural heritage of Romania is many faceted. Appreciating the diversity of the 20 million people who make up this country enriches your experience. The faces, as varied and beautiful as the land itself, tell the story. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm, I, we need to take more time. Every day, we need a face montage. And to remember how many, well, remember our privilege. 
remember the gap between the haves and the have nots and remember the importance of, of traveling. So we come home with a mindset where we're more inclined to build bridges and less inclined to be frightened and build walls. Mm. Mm. I just I just love that. Okay, well, let's. Um, I, I want to share with you right now uh, just a little uh, ad about a book that I'm so happy I was able to write before the pandemic hit. This is my my collection of my favorite people experiences. If you'd like to just have 400 pages of, of my favorite moments traveling, you'll find it in this book that I just wrote called For the Love of Europe. For the Love of Europe shares my favorite memories from decades of travel in 100 essays. This book, filled with vivid photos, is both intimate and fun to read. My greatest hits collection of Europe's most exciting experiences. You'll enjoy an all-day walk along an alpine ridge, soak up the French countryside on a canal barge, and take a friendly swing with a bell ringer in a medieval church spire. It's just you and me as we discover lonesome stone circles, explore ruined castles, and peek in on Europe's leading pipe organist at work. We'll join pilgrims on the Camino de Santiago, hear a French farmer's defense of foie gras, and shake up our livers with an English lord on his old exercise chair. You bounce up and down. And we'll party from Oktoberfest in Munich to the April Fair in Sevilla and go to the races from Siena to Pompolona. And we'll feast from the streets of Istanbul to the toughest bars of San Sebastian. Rather than a guidebook, For the Love of Europe shares tales of a lifetime love affair with Europe. It's 400 pages of travel fun, frolic, and inspiration. My favorite places, people, and stories guaranteed to stoke vivid dreams of happy travel. Well, I hope that you can create your own travel memories with your own travels very soon. You know, I want to remind you, we've got a little time for questions and answers. So we've got a widget there and you can ask a question in the question section. And then we'll get a chance to answer those questions right afterwards. Gabe's going to organize those questions and toss them my way. And we'll be able to connect that way. I do want to take this moment to thank Gabe and Julianne and Ben for being such great partners in this Monday Night Travels. It's I get to uh, enjoy the food and the drink and share stories, but there's a lot of hard work going on behind the scenes. And thank you very much, Julianne, Gabe, and Ben. Also, I want to remind you that if you want to see any of these segments in their entirety without the pauses, in fact, with the entire show, you can do that um, on our website in the TV corner. All of our shows are available for free without ads anytime you like. Also remember this every night's, every Monday night's performance and show is recorded and played the next night so people can watch it if they're unable to make it with us. Now we are in Turkey. Look at that amazing eroded hill, honeycombed with old houses that go back so long with minarets cutting into the sky. This is Cappadocia, the middle of Turkey. Talk about getting off the beaten path. Right now we're gonna go to Cappadocia and we're gonna find these fascinating underground cities. Back on the ground, the terrain invites exploration. People have carved communities into these formations for thousands of years. While many of these evocative caves are abandoned, many cave settlements have grown into thriving towns whose main industry is clearly tourism. For extra guidance, we're joined by my friend and fellow tour guide, Lali Sermon Iran. For years, Lali's led our bus tour groups around Turkey, and for this itinerary, she's joining us. While mainly Muslim today, Anatolia was Christian for five centuries before Islam even arrived. Early Christians had to take shelter. They had to hide from the ancient Roman persecutions. They had to hide from the 7th century Arab invasions. And the landscape around here provided the perfect hideout. It really does. And to actually see what Lolly's talking about, we're descending into Kaimakli, a completely underground city dug out of the rock. Much of Kaimakli was originally dug in Hittite times, over a thousand years before Christ. Later, this underground world provided an almost ready-made refuge. Through the centuries, when invading armies passed through the area, entire communities lived down here for months at a stretch. I'm getting a tour guide deja vu here. For, for 20 years, we've taken groups to this Kaimakli, this underground city. 
and I love taking our groups here, but it is claustrophobic. It does take a lot of crouching and walking. Your knees get quite a workout. And it is literally a tight squeeze for people who are um, bigger than average. And uh, we have to recommend a few people to um, stay up in the fresh air because this can be quite an ordeal if you're not fit and if you're not able to fit through these narrow passageways. But talk about an unforgettable experience. And it's the kind of experiences we love to put together on our tours. In ancient times, Christians were persecuted and actually did go literally underground. This is a remarkable example of their determination to live free and true to their faith. Imagine 300 AD, hiding out down here with your family. In fact, hiding out down here with your entire community and people up there hunting you down. Tourists are free to explore the networks of streets and plazas. You'll find kitchens, cramped living spaces, massive roll away the stone doors, and ingenious ventilation shafts to bring fresh air to the many underground levels. They could have made these tunnels bigger, but that was part of the plan. It certainly made any invader vulnerable. And to conserve oxygen, candlelight was kept to a minimum. It must have been a long, dark wait. But for us, it's back to fresh air and sunshine. We're on our way again. As time went on, sprawling communities still digging caves for homes inhabited entire valleys like Zelva. Around the 10th century, Zelva was one of scores of similar cave communities here in Cappadocia. Cleverly, they wrung a livelihood out of this parched land. Caves served as ancient condominiums, with holes dug out as cooking pits. In addition to living spaces, they were also equipped with natural pantries, cubby holes carved out for storage of food and wine. Big, animal-powered stone wheels ground grain. People ingeniously used whatever nature offered them. Pigeon droppings were collected, providing valuable fertilizer to assure a good harvest in the valley below. Imagine this place centuries ago. It was a thriving community, thousands of people, families everywhere, old people, little kids running up and down these stairs, borrowing salt from the neighbors, and people lived here till the 1950s. Imagine being able to climb through these towns. I mean, I just love Cappadocia for so many reasons. By the way, I just got an email from Lolly just a, a couple of days ago. And, uh, you know, they're dealing with COVID also in Turkey. I've got emails from my friends in Spain and from Ireland and Norway. And we got to remember this COVID is a global thing and the whole planet is struggling with it. And we're in the midst of this. And uh, boy, there's a lot of hardship in Europe right now. Lolly and all of her guides are just marking time and waiting, as are so many people here in the United States. Okay, now we're going to go to Denmark. That's a not an out-of-the-way country, but there's an out-of-the-way corner. It's on the far south. It's an island called Aero, A-E-R-O. It's just across the water from Germany. And when you look at this bit on Aero on, in Denmark, I want to remind you that this is how we're able to do our business at Rick Steves Europe. It's sort of, we got three uh, uh, legs on our, our business stool, TV, guidebooks, and tours. And, you know, we can't do the tours without learning about the place through the guidebooks. When we research the guidebooks, we make all the friends and contacts and take the tours there. And then we couldn't afford to do the TV show and we couldn't afford to update our guidebooks properly without the money the tour generates. And nobody would know about our tours if we didn't do the TV show. So everything works together in a wonderfully symbiotic way. And uh, the way I see it, we're able to invest more in the products that we produce and we're able to charge less and give a better value because they all interweave and work together in a, in a, in a destination like you just saw in, in Turkey or where we're going in Denmark. We've got the TV show, we got the guidebook, and we got the tours and it all works together. Now, when we go to this little island coming up in Denmark, we're gonna be doing a, a, a DIY, a do-it-yourself bike ride around the island. It's one of my favorite kinds of tours to offer in the guidebook and to do it with our tour groups as well. You can do it with a bicycle, you can do it with a car, or you can do it on a tour bus. And it is just a kilometer by kilometer look at the most charming slice of a very charming island, Aero in the south 
of Denmark. For me, the best way to explore Aero is on two wheels. I'm meeting friend and local guide Jan Peterson for an island bike ride. Bike rental's easy. No deposits, no locks. This is Aero. I've recommended this leisurely ride for years in my guidebook to show off the best of this island's charms. The island is 22 miles long, has 7,000 residents, seven pastors, no crosswalks, and three policemen. Historically, Arrow has depended on shipping and farming, mostly dairy and wheat. U-shaped farms are typical throughout Denmark. The three sides block the wind while storing cows, hay, and people. It's the kind of place where local produce, whatever's in season, sits on the roadside for sale on the honor system. We're now riding below sea level. Right. So there's, we're, we're doing this, we've created this bike ride around, <laughs> around the island. It's me and Jan riding tandem in our bikes, chatting about what we're seeing. And one moment the cameraman's up on the top of the dike filming down. Another one, he's parked over here and we do a, a pedal by. And now the cameraman is in the back of the car. The, ho the hood is open, his knees are up by his, uh, by his elbows and he's filming us. And uh, we're trying to keep the right distance away from the car so we don't hear the car's motor. And so my, my microphone's not too far away so it picks up well by the camera, my wireless mic. And Jan is new, at, new to the on-camera work so we're trying to keep our bikes in tandem. He's trying to get his lines right. I'm trying to get my lines right. And I'm so excited. I'm just trying not to giggle. Uh, but this is the fun of making these TV shows. And uh, our little crew is so talented and so passionate about doing a good job. They bring a great show home. Sea is about this height and just behind this dike that was built around 150 years ago to keep uh, the sea out to claim this wasteland that so was here. All of this was reclaimed then? Yes, it is and uh, is uh, today used for grazing for cars. Most of Arrow's villages are further inland, not visible from the sea. Church spires were stunted, designed not to be viewable from marauding pirate ships. This church with a whitewashed exterior dates from the 12th century. Its long nave leads to the altar with gold leaf on carved oak, it's from 1528, just before the Reformation came to Denmark. It's a remarkable church. Yes. A special thing is these reversible pews. Uh, you have the service up here, but when the sermon is on, you have to flip over. Okay, so we watch the service, and then when it's time for the over. sermon, yes. you look pay at the pulpit. To the pulpit. 1528. Whoa. That's old, 500 years old. That was just 11 years after Martin Luther pounded those uh, points of discussion with the Catholic Church on the doors of his, uh, of his monastery. And uh, Scandinavia had the first Lutheran churches in all of Europe. I love these sort of insights we get from our local guides. You know, back then uh, with the Protestants, the big deal was the, the word, the, the sermons. And you didn't have amplification and you had a big church. So you put the pulpit in the middle of the church so he, the, the pastor can be heard by everybody. And then people are able to flip over and look in the other direction when it's time for the service. And then they can all look up at the altar when it's time for the altar. And uh, of course it was a man's world back then. And in the back of the church, you've got 500 years of pastors and they're all men and tell the current pastor, a woman, huge, exciting changes going on all over the place as we become more modern and more equitable. And that's what we see when we travel, the sweep of history. And we get a sort of a broader context and we can realize that there's progress being made and, and it's exciting and it's worth embracing. That is in the middle of the church. In the back of the nave, a list of pastors goes back to 1505, all theologically related to Martin Luther. He's painted with his hand on the Bible as if on a theological rudder steering the church on a true course. The current pastor, Janet, is the first woman on the list in over 500 years. Aero, like Denmark in general, is embracing clean energy. Home to communally owned, state subsidized windmills and one of the world's largest solar power plants, it's well on the way to its goal of energy self-sufficiency. 
This field of solar panels saves 1,500 homes a third on their heating costs. A short walk from the road takes us to a fascinating prehistoric site. 6,000 years ago, this was an early Neolithic burial place. Though Arrow once had more than 200 of these prehistoric tombs, only 13 survive. And Vikings also appreciated the holiness of this site. This is such an evocative. I remember when I was a kid, just 14 years old, visiting my relatives in Norway, Tor's house down in uh, Sandefjord, two hours south of Oslo. And we walked in the neighborhood back behind his friend's house, and they had one of these Viking burial uh, ceremony places. And it's the shape of a Viking ship. So here we saw another one, and I wanted to get my local guide, Jan, to give us the story. Now, in a case like this, I'm doing my interview technique. I know what I want to have in the show. It's got to be really tight. And I've got a, a list of bullet points. It's on a scrap of paper just on the far side of my knee there, and I can glance down at it. And then I can keep hammering away at Jan until we get that information that we want in the tight form so we can put it in the show and really have a lot of valuable information in a short period of time. A lot of valuable information. Hey, and I've, um, I ate my salad and it was a great salad and I finished my salad. Mm. Now it's time for my honey cake. And this honey cake, mm, Georgians love their honey. And this is seven honey cookies, all with sweetened cream and local honey. Mm. Drizzled with honey. And it reminds me when you travel east in Europe, you get a lot of honey. All right, let's listen to the interview from Jan, guided a little bit by me. Spot. Yeah, imagine a thousand years ago, the Viking chief mm. would gather the community here to bury a person here. They built a ship and burned it. They have found pieces of burned wood in the underground here. So this is and actually the shape of a Viking ship. This is the shape it? of a Viking ship. A you have Viking the stern ship. up there. Yeah. And uh, even longer ago, they came here to use this as a holy spot. And this stone burial chamber is actually much older. It's 5,000, 6,000 years old. As old as the pharaohs. Yes. The Vikings recognized this as a holy ground and uh, later on put their the uh, holy spot here. So, got a little hill here. A little hill. We're going to the highest point of the island called Sundshoi. What, is, what does that mean? Seems high. So we're, we're summiting the highest mountain and the Danes called it Seems High. And it gives tour guides to show off their human calculator skills. Seems high. How high is it? 6,750 centimeters. 6,700 centimeters. That's about 2,700 inches. Yeah, something like that. Jan, we've summited arrow. Seems high. Yeah, but worst of you. Sure is. Mm. Okay, here's the quintessential capper for a visit to Arrow. The sun's going down, we're on the beach with these cute little huts. A wonderful Danish word is hugli. Cute, it's cute, it's small, it's cozy, it's, it's um, accessible. There's a conviviality, yeah. You don't need to be rich, everybody's together. And we're on the beach with the mayor. The kids are frolicking in the waves. You see the, the low rays of the sun cutting through the surf and we're playing the guitar and singing sea shanties and, and the shrimp is on the barbie. What a beautiful moment to finish the show. And this is the kind of magic we try to design so people can get that experience in their travels. Just a short stroll from aeroscoping, a narrow spit is lined with cozy beach huts and families savoring a balmy July evening. Denmark embraces the notion that small is beautiful. And here, the concept of sustainability is nothing new. These tiny beach escapes are privately owned on land rented from the town. Each is different, but all are weathered by merry memories of locals enjoying themselves Danish style. To cap our visit, tonight we're joined by the mayor and his friends for a picnic dinner on the beach. A former music teacher, he's leading us in an appropriate song for Arrow. The ship went down, but the sailors survived, making it back to their beloved homes and families. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> 
Oh, yo, that's a happy sound when you're traveling in Denmark, when you're traveling off the beaten path. That's the theme, off the beaten path. Everything you just saw, you can do yourself. Equip yourself in good with good information. Expect yourself to travel smart. Be an extrovert. Meet those people. If an opportunity presents itself and the question is yes or no, I think your answer should be most likely yes. Gabe, we're ready for some questions. All right. Thank you so much, Rick, for introducing us to all of those wonders this evening. Um, we have many good questions, but before we get to those, can we have our word from our sponsor, please? Well, word from our sponsor, I, I would like to, I, I really want to thank uh, our restaurant Skalka. Skalka, you know, there's Georgian restaurants all over the United States. Support your local restaurants during this difficult pandemic time. We want them around when we get through this. And ah, they're scrambling and they're scrambling hard. Our friends at Skalka, just like your friends at your local restaurants, they're they're working hard to get you good stuff. And, and uh, we had some fun, fun food. Remember, it's in the notes if you want the exact thing. But I have thoroughly enjoyed this, the keen Kali, and that is the local dumplings. And I've, uh, mm, this is my second dinner tonight, and I'm, I'm still enjoying it. Um, we had our big boat. Our this is this is called the Kachapuri, and it's like a Georgian pizza, and you'll get that all over the place. There's pizzas in all these different countries. The Turkish pizzas are wonderful. Georgian pizzas, and then, mm, I don't normally go for the big sweet desserts, but the, the honey cake is worth checking out. So that's a word from our love of restaurants. Um, if I wanted to get greedy and give a word of sponsor from us, Rick, Steve, Zero, I'll just tell you, there's a hundred of us. We love to travel. We can't travel this year. We're getting our shots. We're staying healthy. We're taking care of our neighbors in our company. Gabe and, and, and many of our staff, just like Gabe, are every week dedicating hours hours that they're spent their on paid time at Rick Steve's Europe, but we're using some of those hours because we're not that busy to go out and help in the community. As a company, we're contributing over 400 hours a week to community service, Meals on Wheels, food banks, um, pulling invasive weeds out of the parks. I mean, keeping track of seniors that are lonely and, and shut in and making sure they're okay. And we're enjoying the opportunity to be connected. In normal times, we're scrambling and we tend to be unconnected. It's an American thing to be unconnected. But now we're recognizing that there are great divisions in our society. Many of our neighbors will never see their names on a plane ticket to go to Europe. And you know, that's tough, but this is a chance when we need to look out for each other. We'll get our travels back, we'll get our business back. But right now we're staying together, we're helping our neighbors and we're looking forward to the time when all of our country figures out that, hey, we got to get vaccinated because this ca ship cannot sail until we all get on board and then we'll be traveling again. So we're thankful to have everybody join us as we wait this out and as we try to be good citizens. Let's have some questions. Okay. All right, Rick. So one common question from Sonia and many others, um, you've talked about your, your love of this um, Eastern European food. Did you try that supremely stinky cheese and what did you think? <laughs> I did. I like stinky cheese. It's been my, I gotta say, I've been evangelical about stinky cheese ever since I was leading minibus tours around. And Gabe, you know, that was a long, long time ago when it was just me driving eight people in a minibus. I had a cooler and in the cooler, I kept the picnic stuff and um, the smell of the cheese would always sort of take over the whole, all the food that was in there. So it was tough to share my love of stinky cheese, but um, I had people come on my tour in those early days. And I remember one man said, you know, I, I just eat Tillamook and all he wanted was Tillamook cheese. <laughs> I don't know if that's a national thing, but in the West Coast, it's great Org Orgonian cheese, but it's not very stinky. And I had a personal crusade to get him into some stinky cheese. Now, I understand why you spend a lot of money for good stinky cheese. Um, life is too short for mediocre cheese, I'll tell you that. And uh, when you're in the Czech Republic, you can try that stinky cheese. It's quite famous. As Hans has said, it comes with little mints and uh, you want to eat that before you get home so your wife will kiss you. <laughs> So Rick, you mentioned some of your um, early tours and actually Jackie, who's joining us tonight, was on a tour with you 30 years ago. Um, and she was just curious, um, over the decades, um, what things have changed with your tours and what things have remained the same? Well, that is a long story, Jackie. And that's why in two weeks from tonight, I'm giving a talk called The Irreverent History of Rick Steve's Europe. 
our company used to be called Europe Through the Back Door. This was in the Europe Through the Gutter days. And uh, a lot has changed. Um, we, I used to have this personal crusade to inflict on people the stress of not knowing if they would have a room. For, for a long time, we didn't have hotel reservations. And uh, we would just scramble and find reservations at the end of each day. Uh, a lot of times, I really felt like you need to figure out that a lot of people are thankful to have a roof over their health. So stop complaining about no hot water, you know. Uh, but of course, we're done with that. That's that's not how you do tourism and that you can't hit that your, your, your customers in the head with this sort of a sensibility or insensibility. But our tours now are much more comfortable, much more professional, much safer. Uh, and uh, there's something I'm very proud of. But I do enjoy telling the story. And I've got the story with slides, Jackie, that will show two weeks from tonight. So a lot has changed. Um, and uh, I think one thing that has changed is we are all a more affluent and comfortable society now than we were back in the 1980s. And you could throw things at people in the 80s and they would take them and you couldn't throw them at people today. You couldn't throw them at me either, to be honest. So I love to think back on those uh, good old days of picnics and sleeping in the circus tent at, in Munich with 400 roommates. It's kind of like a cross between Woodstock and the slumber party. Everybody gets a mattress and some blankets and free tea in the morning and try not to listen to the, the, the grunting over in the corner there because we're all trying to get a good night's sleep. Uh, those were wild days. And uh, that's kind of the backpacker mystique. It would be fun as a tour organizer to um, capture that backpacker mystique, but you can't do it. You can't have the magic of roughing it without roughing it. And today people would rather not rough it. And that's fine with me. So Rick, as you talk about people sometimes being uncomfortable or disoriented while they travel, um, I know that Gail and a few others were wondering about as you get further off the beaten track to these offbeat destinations, is there less English spoken and how do you handle that? Well, first of all, when you, when you think about English spoken, a lot of times you would think a country like Montenegro or like Lithuania or even Portugal would have fewer people speaking English than a more mainstream country like Germany or France or Italy. But counterintuitively, it's the little countries, the Bulgarias, where people have to speak English in order to have a big world. There's only 5 million people that speak Norwegian natively. And anybody who's educated in Norway will choose not Greek, but English. So they'll have a bigger world. So if you go to Lithuania, if you go to Montenegro, if you go to Portugal, if you go to Norway, you'll find uh, most educated people speak English. Now, when you get way out in the rural areas, that's where you find people don't have the education and they don't have the jobs that require English language skills. And you're very likely to find people there that have no idea about English or America and that sort of thing. And that's a, a beautiful experience. And that's um, why a guide is really valuable. It's, it's helpful to have a guide in, in corners like that and the good news is guides cost less, much less in corners like that than they do in Paris or London. So you'll get double the value out of your guide for half the price. That's a good value right there. Um, Rick, some people were also wondering, especially you focused a lot on some of those former Soviet areas. Um, what is the human rights situation like in some of those um, formerly Soviet and communist countries these days? Uh, well, Russia is famously bad on human rights, obviously. I mean, the, the challenger to Putin is dying in prison right now. Uh, if you're gay in Russia, you better not be uh, flagrantly gay or openly gay or try to be a, a big shot in your society because that's going to be your uh, Achilles heel in a lot of ways. Um, and, um, you know, it's just different countries are on parallel evolutionary tracks when it comes to getting hip with uh, civil liberties and, and uh, uh, celebrating diversity. And a lot of countries are way behind us and a lot of countries are in front of us. Generally in Eastern Europe, I would say they're a little bit behind us. Um, and it's a great way to, it's a great reason to travel because when you travel, there's that interaction between peoples. And then if somebody is afraid of uh, this or that person because of whatever reason they're different, they're probably afraid of that person because they don't have any friends who are like that. And when we travel, we diffuse that fear because we become friends and you get to know people who are different than you. Uh, I've personally benefited from that. My kids have benefited from that. That's one of the missions of our tours is to help our travelers meet people who find different truths to be self-evident and God-given. And they go home 
more comfortable with the fact that different people do things differently, and that's a celebration. Uh, Rick, we had a, we had one um, participant tonight that was saying that they don't can, they're not particularly religious, and was wondering about how you can plan your itinerary not to focus as much on religious sites. But I'm also wondering, I know you've said before, if something's not to your liking, change your liking, and that mm -hmm. there are a lot of religious sites. So maybe what are some good ways to not have uh, focused on religious sites? And what are good ways to maybe change your liking to appreciate a faith tradition that's not your own? Boy, that's a good question. You know, for one thing, we got to remember that uh, faith, whatever religion, permeated society just until the last generation or two. So when you're looking at anything historic, you're looking at uh, a kind of faithfulness, a kind of uh, religion permeating society that a lot of people would have a hard time even imagining today. Also, we got to remember we're in a very affluent corner of the world. And, uh, you know, people who are affluent are self-assured and less likely to need God. Uh, that's why the Scandinavians, I think, are the least church-going people in Europe. And that's why a lot of Americans don't think they need to have any sort of sense, sense of the spiritual realm or, or they get it outside of organized religion or whatever. But if you look around the, the planet, uh, it's a more faithful world than what we realize. There's more Lutherans in Namibia than there are in the United States. Uh, that's my particular uh, denomination. And uh, it's always a reminder that when you travel, if you go down to Latin America, uh, I've been to Latin America with German uh, pastors who find that the local parishioners down there have a stronger uh, faith than, than a pastor in, in Germany. Uh, even though there's nothing weak about the pastor's faith in Germany, it's just there's a lot of exciting things going on with people's faith. Um, I would say, and this is something I try to do, I, I find whatever religious culture is going on fascinating. And I find it intriguing. I find it inviting. I find it fragrant. I find it beautiful. And uh, the last thing I want to do is go in there and try to um, proselytize my particular brand of faith. Uh, I've learned long ago to park my Protestant sword at the door. And when I step into that mosque or synagogue or temple, become a, a person who respects that local faith. Um, it's easy to think it's all hocus pocus if it's a different culture than yours, but I think that's wrong. And um, I don't think an, a person from our culture can condemn uh, 800 million people in India for being uh, Hindu, devout Hindus. Uh, you can condemn what fundamentalist Hindus do that is hateful and, and, uh, and, and evil. I mean, you know, just like you can condemn fundamentalist Christians or Jews or Muslims for things that they do that are not in keeping with their faith. But our challenge as travelers, I think, is not to judge, but just to celebrate and to enjoy and not be threatened by it. So that's kind of what you're talking about, Gabe, is if it's not your liking, change your liking while you're there. But you don't have to, you know, I'm, I'm a person of faith and I'm a person who loves music and I love history. So that's what I'm into when I travel. Uh, if you're a person who loves domestic animals and, and, and dogs and shopping and, uh, you know, um, any number of other things, uh, there's ways you can focus on that. I, I love the thought that you can go to a culture any number of ways. One of my best um, um, colleagues is a, a man named Fred Plotkin who writes the most amazing book about Italian cuisine. And he gets to Italian culture through the cuisine. Much more, it's much more than, than a, a food guide. It's a cultural guide through the lens of somebody who appreciates cuisine the same way I'll get to Italian culture through history and art, you see. Uh, Fred's not as enthusiastic about the history and art avenue as the cuisine avenue and vice versa for me, but it's both two different ways to get to and celebrate and understand and enjoy that culture. So find whatever turns you on and get into it that way. And there's an amazing, amazing array of ways you can approach cultures. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you're a person that has, uh, if you're a person that's angry about religion, then you got to do some work because there's a lot of people that for good reason are angry about religion. They've had a miserable experience with it. Uh, and uh, you might find uh, uh, some things harder to take in stride. But I find my travels go really well, regardless of where I travel. And I've traveled in places with every religion you can imagine by just uh, trying to embrace it and trying to give, you know, try to recognize that it's a cultural thing that, that I have a hard time with because it's so foreign to me, but, it, but it's, it's a beautiful thing. 
All right, Rick, we have time for one more question. Um, this question is for Kim, from Kimberly. And in the spirit of offbeat wonders, she was just wondering, what is one of the quirkiest or most unusual sites um, that you have seen? And if you don't mind, I actually would share my own um, because it's from our Best of Switzerland tour. Um, it starts in Lucerne and I was particularly tickled to find a place called Glacier Park that was made by an eccentric businessman who not only wanted to show some unusual rock formations caused by glaciers, but he was also an avid traveler and loved La Alhambra in Granada and created an elaborate hall of mirrors based on La Alhambra. So I found it quite unexpected wow. to be wandering through a simulacrum um, La Alhambra while I was starting out in Switzerland on our tour. And where was that in Switzerland, Gabe? In, in Lucerne. In Lucerne. Wow. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great museums in Switzerland. You know, I, I went to a museum which was a, a warehouse for antiquities. And they, it was just like you're going into a warehouse and everything was in big baskets and stuff. And you had a headset and, and you would click when you saw something, it would tell you what's in this basket. And uh, I mean, there was a, I remember there was a guillotine in there and I just have never seen a real guillotine. And it was a guillotine that was the last guillotine used in Switzerland until way into the 1800s. Uh, and, and that was just fascinating. In, in Switzerland, uh, there's a museum filled with art uh, done by people who were locked up because they were considered criminally insane. Uh, I found that really interesting. When I was in Zagreb in Croatia, the capital of Croatia, there's a wonderful museum about naive art art from idiot savants, guys that have no formal training that just are just like, wow, where did this come from? And he's just totally homegrown artist. Um, of course, you got your bone houses all over Europe where you can uh, go into a, a cemetery or a cellar and you find monks that have hung up for a hundred years. They held their, hung their brothers up to dry and then decorated with their bones. Uh, those are quite, in <laughs> those are quite interesting. But um, yeah, there's, uh, there's quirky sites all over the place. And a lot of them are kind of goofy, goofy commercial adventures, but a lot of them are honest to goodness, fascinating museums. I mean, the guy who, um, Hansen, Dr. Hansen, who uh, leprosy is named after, uh, Hansen's disease. He was a doctor in uh, Bergen, in Norway. And uh, there's the, uh, lepr the first leprosy hospital right there in Bergen. And it is, it's not a famous museum, but wow, what a fascinating trip that is to, to check that out. So uh, there's, there's, there are military museums on top of the mountains in Slovenia in World War I. Uh, Hemingway wrote about this, uh, but you know, the, the, uh, the, the enemies would fight up at, in the mountain peaks and they'd be frozen and they'd be up there right through the winter. And you can go up there now and you can see the trenches and the battlements that were on top of the mountains. Uh, there are so many fascinating museums. Um, that'd be a fun book to write actually to collect all of these most, um, odd and curious museums in Europe. And actually, they're all over the world. Hey, um, but I guess that was my last question. I could talk all night because it's so much fun to have everybody coming by. I want to remind you, this is something we do every Monday night. We have Monday night travel. And uh, we're going to keep doing this uh, for the foreseeable future. Next week, we're talking about the best markets in Europe. I love markets. There's a lot of great markets we're going to visit. After that, I'm going to share my irreverent history of Rick Steves Europe. And that's when we're going to go back to the days when I actually bought this hat and was excited about it. And I filled it up with cute pins. I mean, look at that. My dad and I were having a competition to see who could get the nicest pins, but that was from a very early trip. But I'll take you back to the early beginnings of our company back when, back when, I'm not gonna tell you because it's just too dicey, but back when. Uh, so that's two weeks from now. And then after that, we got a show on uh, natural wonders in Europe. So lots of good travels coming up. Right now, I just wanna thank you all very much. I hope you've enjoyed your evening and I wanna wish you happy travels, even if we're just staying home for a little while.